fundamentally what customized employment is, is a real sort of shift in thinking and practice from what really amounts to uh, our biggest service delivery challenge in 2012. So we're still dealing with the remnants of the least restrictive environment circa 1972 and where many of our students with autism and other developmental disabilities when they get into high school they will tend to be uh, segregated in life skills classes then uh, transitioning um, to day programs we don't have sheltered workshops anymore in British Columbia but we still have fundamentally this continuum with its um, matriculation assumption so we have students graduating from high school on a wait list they will tend to end up in a community-based day program where the assumption was that they would matriculate through these various programs and once they learn a set of skills in the community day program, they're getting them ready for perhaps an enclave or work crew. And then when they show readiness there, then ending up in inclusive or supported employment. And the research is pretty clear that the matriculation assumption was false. So what's here, this inclusive employment wasn't happening. So what um, customized employment has done is really done away with the matriculation assumption and there's a zero reject principle so everybody is deemed able to work in inclusive settings so that's the um, that's the focus so really what it is now is moving from the continuum with employment being the real anchor to the uh, inclusive life and with paid job in hand, then sequentially working through that planning process and the adult support process where you move from paid employment to building my social relationships in the community, uh, home of my own. I'll share with you how critical um, having that paid job is for that anchor. And I'll share with you some case examples where paid employment opens up so many other doors to the inclusive life. This brief history of CBI consultants, we really began in uh, 1988. So most people will think of CBI consultants as a positive behavior support agency. Uh, we were working with individuals with severe challenging behavior coming out of our institutions, Project 88. And at that time, you really started to see the beginnings of um, person-centered planning and strength-based planning. So that's really been a core of, of what we do and who we are. And person-centered planning is a, a, a real essential feature of customized employment. We were really founded on those principles in 1988 on person-centered planning, positive behavior support, and inclusion. So um, the customized employment was really a natural fit for us. Um, because this has been the overall framework that CBI Consultants has been operating on since our inception in 92. It's what we call the lifestyle development process. So in the lifestyle development process, we really begin with the vision planning and strength-based personal profile and really start beginning with building that inclusive life as the foundational principles and then applying what we call our support strategies or uh, the technical strands in terms of communication supports, uh, uh, behavioral supports, and systematic instruction. So you'll see uh, momentarily how these are essential features of customized employment, particularly systematic instruction, as well as the uh, person-centered planning. So we really got into customized employment. It began uh, actually f uh, four years ago on a small innovation grant with um, Community Living British Columbia. So we were actually able to um, develop a collaborative partnership with Dr. Paul Wayman from Virginia Commonwealth University. So uh, Dr. Wayman is a pioneer in supported employment and uh, he was very gracious to share his uh, research and mentorship with us on the customized employment. So that 
really began about uh, three years ago. So in the first year, we really um, were able to go to um, VCU, spent about three days with his, um, with his team. And then the first year or so, Dr. Wayman supported CBI. Um, and then that small innovation grant grew to about eight pilot projects uh, throughout British Columbia. And there's actually now a 10-year plan that Dr. Wayman um, helped put together with Community Living British Columbia to really uh, scale up employment in BC. So when we look at um, customized employment and current supported employment, uh, here's some of the essential features. So we're looking at authentic assessment and strength-based person-centered planning. So what we mean by authentic assessment is uh, historically individuals would be screened out for employment, so they would have to come and do a, oftentimes a serious uh, series of uh, paper pencil tests. Um, if they had a range of disabilities or weren't able to take the bus, they were deemed unemployable. Whereas in customized employment, everybody is deemed employable, so there's a zero reject principle. An authentic assessment means we're going out with the individuals in their home settings, community settings, work settings. So that's where we're really assessing their skills and strengths. We've got customer choice, workplace inclusion. So what we mean by that is not only am I, uh, do I receive the same pay as my peers on the work site, I'm supported by the natural supports, and also all uh, functions at the workplace I'm included in. So um, it's not just the paid employment, but uh, Christmas parties, any um, of the um, social. You know, social events, exactly. Um, I'm also paid at competitive prevailing wages, so it's not subsidized wages. I'm not paid less than someone else on the job. And uh, uh, customer-directed services with individualized workplace supports. So when we look at thinking of inclusive, customized employment under this broad umbrella has um, these fundamental elements. So it's about customer choice, most definitely a strength-based perspective, competitive wages, resource ownership, um, job negotiation. So it's this big umbrella of what we've really learned through that supported employment process during the last 20 years or so. Um, but at its core, customized employment is really about a strength-based perspective, identifying the particular strengths of the individual. The reason we call it customized employment is then we tend to have to go in and identify jobs that are um, typically not uh, uh, listed on a, a, a more typical job description. So you really need to go in, take the individual's particular strengths, identify potential themes and potential workplaces that the person could work, and they really got to spend some time at that workplace, identify unmet needs oftentimes, and negotiate our job carve. Carve out a job that's not there as a traditional um, uh, job, but in the end, it fundamentally is a mutually beneficial relationship for the, the employer and the individual. So you're really bringing a set of strengths and gifts to the uh, organization and finding those unmet needs. So let's look at um, the person-centered planning piece. Support employment really developed in the late 1970s, early 80s. It was a natural outgrowth of the deinstitutionalization movement, the general movement away from segregated services. It was a tremendous uh, paradigm shift from center-based sheltered workshop, uh, adult activity center types of services into real work in competitive employment. Supported employment has beautifully drawn upon the person-centered planning concepts because what we found is that those individuals with the most significant disabilities have a tremendous reservoir of skills and interests and desires that are not immediately 
obvious when you look for jobs that are posted in the newspaper or in the want ads. So using a person-centered planning approach, we have been able to help individuals with quadriplegia, paraplegia, severe traumatic brain injury, um, severe and profound mental retardation, brainstorm out the different types of things that they like to do in their life and the way they like to spend their life. And we know also that consumer choice on the type of work they like to do is, correlates very highly with job retention. There has been a, a tremendous um, explosion of excitement because we now know that virtually everybody can work in the right hand. So the shift there, and this is sort of the evolution of support employment, to, to typically support and employment in the 80s was um, more supply side driven. So really taking a look at identifying the jobs that were in the community, so really coming at it from the business perspective. You didn't really see that person-centered planning piece so much. So the, what were the available positions and jobs and then placing individuals who traditionally were deemed unemployable in those particular jobs. So you see the evolution now and the person-centered planning piece was really um, critical to that change. So it's, it's shifted more from, um, sorry, from the demand side, business side, to really I, teasing out those strengths and gifts um, that each individual has and then going and finding the job that matches the, the, the individual strengths. So it's a very sort of significant shift and that's where the person-centered planning piece really comes in in customized employment. Okay, so let's look at the, the first part of customized employment is called uh, discovery. So that's the authentic um, assessment piece. So in the discovery phase, really are pulling together um, through uh, interviews, meeting the person, and actually hanging out with the person in their favorite activities. They may not even be job related. You want to really find out, okay, what are your favorite activities? What are your environmental preferences, social preferences? skill set, um, uh, and spending upwards of 40 hours with the individual going to the places that they do really well in. So in that discovery phase, we're really trying to tease out what's called the ideal conditions of employment. And this is the person-centered planning piece. So identifying the environments that the person does really well in, which is a pretty critical feature when we're supporting individuals with autism, where the job may be a very good match in terms of the skills that they bring, but the environment is not a good match. So we're identifying environments that the person does um, well in, um, people preferences, the uh, um, social cohorts, cohorts that they do well with, uh, right down to interpersonal styles that work well for the individual. Preferred activities, the hopes and dreams, skill set, learning style. So taking all of those pieces and funneling those down into what we call those ideal conditions for employment. But this skill set and in a work environment that's quiet, uh, interaction styles of the individuals at the workplace have these dimensions. So. You really have a very detailed personal profile, strength-based profile that we distill down to what's called the ideal conditions of employment. So once you have those ideal conditions of employment, then we're ready to go into the next phase. So the next phase then is the job development and job exploration and customization. So Coming out of the um, discovery phase, you might have, have a composite of the, the strengths of the individual and a number of themes that we might want to explore. Uh, for some individuals, it might be a water theme. So water seems to be one of the things that they you know, love going to the, to the swimming pool, the, you know, the Capilano hatchery. So 
create a brainstorm exercise with the family and the team and say, how many work environments represent that theme? And then we would go and spend some time in those various job sites and getting to know the, um, the, you know, the job. And oftentimes in customized employment, in this phase, you actually don't come and say, I've got so-and-so that we would like to you know, bring to the table for employment. We come and say, I'd like to know more about your business and explain who we are as customized employment agency. And businesses are very open to, to share what they do. And then if we see, so once we're in the door, we're able to get a better understanding of what that business is about with the ideal conditions of employment in hand, then we can start to take a look at some of those unmet needs and see if there's a good match. So if we see that there's a good match and there is a potential, um, if we see there's a potential to carve out a, a position in an unmet need, then we'd move to the next phase, which would be the ne negotiation and say, we have a person that has this skill set uh, that we'd like to introduce you to and we'd like to discuss the customized position. And then, once we've got the job secured, here's where the systematic construction piece comes in, which is a very uh, critical element. So, coming in, uh, doing task analyses of the job, identifying the natural supports within the, the, the job. And this is a classic, classic... Um, problem and issue that we've seen not only in our high schools with the one-to-one -one teaching supports but in many of the traditional uh, job placements when we've gone to employers uh, the job coach never faded support so the job coach had stayed on site and what that does is uh, you end up with a the individual and their job coach they're not fully embedded in the organization the natural supports don't see that they can support the individual. So it's not unlike the uh, individuals in our schools where at recess they're with their, their teaching assistant, they're not fully included. So this is a real critical feature where you fade to the natural supports in the work site and then we're there to monitor and problem solve as needed. So before we go on to some of the other phases, let's take a look at uh, a couple of examples of this part of the process. So the strength-based assessment, ideal conditions for employment, and the job carving that we needed to do. The first individual I'm going to show you is uh, Jeremiah. And Jeremiah actually came to us as a uh, behavioral referral um, where he was having uh, escape-motivated behavior. He didn't want to go to his day program. Um, and... Uh, there wasn't very much happening for him at his day program. But uh, Jeremiah loved uh, barbecues, and he loved shiny things, and he loved to help. So we did a, uh, a brainstorm of potential, potential places where um, barbecues live. Uh, so they came up with a whole bunch of places. There's uh, Rona, there's uh, Home Hardware, there's Johnson's Barbecue, which was too far away. Um, so we ended up at the Home Depot. And um, it, it's very interesting. We assume that many of the employers are really not open to these ideas and that that's a, a fundamental barrier. That hasn't been our experience is when we do a really good job of bringing that, that skill set and we do a really good match, um, employers, uh, I wouldn't say universally, but, but many are really open. Then Home Depot does have a uh, diversity policy. So they're really trying to promote diversity as well. Businesses uh, understand as well that there's a, a number of upsides from the business end. Higher retention rates, um, consumers will actually spend dollars in a business that 
openly employs individuals with disabilities? Um, does consumers see them as being more socially conscious uh, corporations? So there's a number of upsides to employers, and many of them are starting to actually um, see what benefits accrue to their, to their business. So we were able to carve a job for um, uh, Jeremiah in the, uh, not just barbecues, but he's, there's a lot of, if you go to any Home Depot, you will see in many of the departments, particularly the um, uh, barbecues and other areas, there's nobody that really cleans them. And really, you'll see a lot of dust accruing. And, and uh, we were able to say, we've got uh, Jeremiah, we've got somebody that we think would be a really good fit for the Home Depot team. So we took his barbecue, shiny things, um, and love of helping. My name is Jeremiah, and I am working at a Home Depot. And, uh, I will play hard and I'm that be filled Why do you like working at Home Depot and what do you like most about your job? To work with our people. Work with our, with our people. Uh, with helping the project. Oh, I always need a bar here. How does it make you feel that you have a real job? I feel so better. I like my uh, like my life. Yeah, uh, my name is uh, Benjamin, and, and I'm the father of uh, Jeremiah. Uh, I think he's really met the people that uh, you know that 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 he works with. He's uh, pretty happy. I mean, like he always go in and say hi and smile. And the people, you know, say hi and smile back to him too. Even with the customer, I mean, like you know, he, he always try to help the customer too. Yeah, and all of the uh, previous em employers just 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 love him. Same as Home Depot. Like when he get to Home Depot, he go straight to the room to get changed and you know get into the uh, work habit. I mean, he he works when 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 he works, he works. You know what? I do believe that it's a mutual benefit for both, for Home Depot as well. That uh, we are so glad that they are uh, willing to open their door and, and hire someone like our son Jeremiah. I'm going to show you another clip um, with another individual that we actually totally different job on customer service um, with uh, um, autism and talking to his supervisor, which is in a, in the supervisor is talking very candidly and openly of what, um, and this has come up many times with what the employers say is how it's helped them as a team, how they work better as a team because it's really exposing them to more diversity in the workplace, um, individuals that may have different support needs than what they're used to. Um, but you'll see sort of, and this is something that we didn't really anticipate, um, nor does the research talk about that very much, about uh, the economic benefits, the retention benefits are, are well documented, but how teams are strengthened and how they function better as teams with the more um, diversity in the workplace. Okay. So you'll see on the systematic uh, instruction, pretty traditional task analyses. You'll take, we'll take a look at um, fairly low tech supports for the most part. Um, another offshoot that we've seen for a number of individuals that are using some tech, uh, iPads on the, on the jobs or where we've created. Um, some visual supports for them in terms of where things are. Um, uh, we were supporting one individual at uh, Thrifty's Foods, so she had a, um, a binder with visual supports of where things were in each aisle, and the employer there said, I, I, we would like that as a universal 
uh, design element. We'd like those for all of our employees. So what we're seeing is the adaptations tend to be uh, pretty uh, minimal, uh, low-tech solutions that uh, um, don't interfere with the natural workplace supports. And in many instances, the employer will actually go, I'd like that support. This enhances my whole business. So this was an individual that we were working with um, uh, who uh, couldn't read, but she was working at the fish hatchery and she had to do some stocking so she could match to colors. So, you know, just really fairly things that we've known for a long time in terms of systematic instruction, taking a look at if we can't teach the skill directly, what, ad what adaptations do we need to put in place to make them successful? So this is really the customized employment process. So you begin with discovery. Um, we've got our profile, our ideal conditions for employment. And then there are a whole number of fidelity checks and quality indicators that are part of that process. And we've found now that on average, this is what it's taken us in those various phases. So our discovery is roughly about 25 hours that we spend with the individual. On average, job developments, obviously it can vary, um, but about 25 hours, 45 hours in terms of job coaching. Um, and then from 12 to 22 in terms of monitoring. So we found on average, We've been able to get individuals paid employment with roughly about 125 hours of support. Um, and that placement is at or below the cost of a placement in a day program for one year. The average cost of a placement in a day program uh, is from 15000 to $35,000. Um, so in terms of economically viable, it's, it's at the same level or below than a day program placement. And then there's all the accountability and outcome data that's built in, in terms of the reporting. So our reporting is on number of placements, type of placement, um, the pay, as well as um, the time it's taking us to do it. Let's look at a couple more examples here, and then we'll go into uh, some of the issues around conversion and how significant that's going to be in terms of our, um, traditionally, how we're doing things in adult services in our traditional program. Braden, he's an individual with autism. He's, uh, um, he's not deaf, but he uses uh, sign language primarily to communicate. And through the um, relationship that we had um, with Home Depot and Jeremiah, we started to develop the relationship where they understood and they said, well, this is a very beneficial relationship. We would like to work together with CBI for more placements. And they understood that we would only bring an individual to a particular uh, store if it was a really good match for the individual's um, uh, and the individual's ideal conditions of employment. So uh, Braden had never actually been employed. Um, he was deemed unemployable, so every time he would go to a service, they said, well, um, sorry, you're unemployable. So we were able to get him a position in customer service. I feel very used to working at Home Depot. And I am a very hard worker. I know that I'm a good worker. I do a lot there. And I'm always, uh, I have a good time, and I'm very, I'm very focused on my work. Well, I've learned um, to sweep and to clean up and take care of the garden center. And uh, I've learned a lot of dusting and different chores like that around the workplace. Carrying around furniture and knowing where it goes. Um, dusting the displays, making sure it's clean, and dusting the lights in that area and making sure that it's clean. And in the hardware section, the knobs and the doors, 
making sure that everything is tidy and then organized. And making sure that parts and their numbers match where they are. And I work in the painting section. And knowing uh, where all the colors go and that they're in the right slots. Keeping things organized. And I work with the books categorizing where they go so that they're in the right place. I use my iPhone and I write out sentences or pieces of paper. I use that to communicate with customers when they ask me if they, um, or if it's, even if it's something that I don't know, then I work on figuring out with them um, to get the knowledge to help them out. And my goal is to uh, improve my communication with customers and, and working with them. I feel that's something that even still is tough for me. I, I liked the job coach very much. I feel like they really helped me to develop. When I first started working, and they would um, work with me and um, help me out with different things. And then uh, I gained independence as they uh, helped me out, but, but I was more on my own. And as time went on, they really helped me to, to grow. And I really like being independent as well and working with them, um, but not as closely. I think that's really great. So I think it's good, and I, I really love working with um, a job coach. When we're looking for the first job as well, because it's the first job, we're not looking for the ultimate and ideal job because we know that uh, we want to... We, we, we want to customize, we want it to be a really good fit. We want the person, pers the, the person to first experience their first paid job and the responsibilities. What we're starting to see, you'll see with Braden, where he starts to set other goals. So that you start to see the self-esteem build and then other goals start to build from that in terms of my next career choice going back to school. Finish up with a clip of the um, his supervisor at home. I think Braden went from a very quiet, um, almost shy individual when he first started to uh, a very open and um, social individual. You know, the, the biggest change that I saw was uh, how Braden comes into work um, from when he started. You know, he um, would give people a wave to, you know, six months into the role. Uh, he was approaching uh, associates in our lunchroom and wanting to engage in conversation. So uh, when Braden would come into work, everybody knew that Braden was in the building. So, and I think, um, you know, Braden is, has a lot of value to add to not only Home Depot, but any employer. And so I think for him, he's you know, he's, he's got a lot to offer, and uh, I think Braden knows that, and Braden's very proud of that. And um, so as far as what it offers in his life, I think it's, it's um, a win-win for both the employer and for Braden. Uh, I didn't find any challenges. I think the communication was very good. Um, the, 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 e the communication through email, you know, phone calls, um, it was yourself and um, the other consultants that we've worked with through CBI um, has, have always made it a very smooth um, process. Uh, I'm, a, I'm an advocate. I think that um, other employers definitely need to um, broaden uh, their, their hiring practices and, um, and really take a look at the, the, the benefits of, um, of working with, uh, with CBI and um, you know I, I think it's just a matter of um, you know, taking that step, and uh, um, it's definitely worth it. That's coming back more and more when we do it well, when we really identify the individual's strengths, really getting to know the business as well. So there's those two parts, really getting to understand the business needs, the culture, how they operate, um, really being respectful of um, their support needs, so how do they need to be supported, um, being, being available if an issue arises to be able to come back. So I'm going to show you a couple more examples uh, of how the job is actually uh, starts to really open up 
other life domains and areas for the individual. I'm going to show you Charlie now, and Charlie was a perfect example of uh, Charlie um, has autism. He had just graduated from high school. Um, Charlie, uh, he had uh, reasonably good verbal skills, but was incredibly shy. Um, it was very difficult to get anything but a single word utterance from Charlie. And Charlie was sitting at home waiting on uh, a wait list for a day program. And Charlie's mom came to a presentation on customized employment the CLBC did and uh, referred uh, Charlie to the customized employment program. Charlie had a number of skills, computer skills. He does also have, um, uh, he has uh, um, some mobility issues with uh, uh, his right hand, I believe. But a number of data entry skills um, that we thought would be a really good match for one of the, the leads that we had in a uh, pharmaceutical shipping company. And we had to customize the positions multiple times during the first two years because he moved from shipping up into the office. And then we went back four years later just to see how things were going with Charlie um, and just to see how the job had opened up multiple horizons in other areas uh, was something that we hadn't expected or predicted. Charlie can help out in many different um, it might take him a little bit longer to grasp on how to do it, but as long as we sit with him and show him step by step, I would say within a day or two he can do anything that anybody else can do. Basically, we found the easiest way for Charlie is to show him how to do it, walk him through the steps, and make sure that the steps are written down for him so he can just read his paper and be like, okay, if I'm stuck at this specific point, where do I go next? He was very shy, not really a social boy. Uh... They had a hard time opening up to, to the co-workers and stuff. Over the last four years, he's opened up more. He's gained more, a lot of confidence now. Uh, he's not afraid to ask for help. Um, he always talk about what he does on the weekend. He's more sociable, like I said, and uh, what movies he watch. Uh, he's played like hockey games. I feel like that he has a full social life out there now. Like, Apparently he goes to uh, holiday trips by love with a few of his friends now, so he's not afraid to do anything on his own now. Apparently what I've heard from his mom that he's became more responsible at home and she's just, you know, more more responsible. Yeah, I'm not, not afraid to if he asks his help help, I'm not afraid to help him out. Because he's just like one of the other like another friend, right? That's how I see him. We hadn't seen Charlie in four years. So when uh, uh, Sherry um, Adam, which was his job coach from CBI, went to see him to film this, said, well, well, how are things going? He said, well, I just got back from Cali. And she went, pardon me? He said, I just came back from Cali. I was in California with my friends. So he's, you know, we, uh, socially, you know, he started... You know, first started with uh, another individual he was working with, and they shared a love of computer games. So they started playing computer games together, met some other individuals, started going out with them because he loved hockey as well. So they go to the pub night to the point where um, you know, he's going on trips independently to California with his friends. So you really saw um, w uh, incredible growth with Charlie over the four-year period with the pay job. The first thing he did with his first paycheck was take his family out for dinner. Um, and then you saw it was a really good fit. You saw that the language that the supervisor is learning uh, or, or has really you know, embedded in their practice. Everyone has different learning styles. So that was really it around the natural supports. So, okay, on a new job duty, at first we get called in a couple of times when they would carve a new job or try a new job. So we would come in, but we'd show them, and it's like, Charlie has the same learning style, so you, know, you can do this as well. So if you want to change the, a new job, this is how you show uh, Charlie. And you know, uh, we hadn't heard from them you know, 
Well, they'll do check-ins with us, but we really hadn't, uh, there was really no need to do any monitoring over the last four years. And then we were pleasantly surprised to see how different aspects of his life and his social life had really grown out of that job. Okay, let's look at one more and then we'll move along. This is, um, this is a, uh, also a four-year story. This, was, uh, this is Kevin, um, also with, um, on the aut um, autism spectrum. Now, Kevin's mom was very active. She had read the research and literature and was very active starting at 14, going to job fairs and really looking at employment as an essential feature. Now, Kevin was doing very well academically, but there wasn't really any focus at, uh, in high school on the employment piece. So this really came from, uh, you'll hear Kevin's mother speaking, and a job came up at the local library as a job page. So it was an $18 an hour job, which we knew Kevin would, um, would excel at in the Dewey Decimal System. But we knew he wouldn't do it very well on the job interview. So really what we needed to do was talk to, you'll see Denise who actually hired him, to talk about the interview process and how that might look. And when we found out that it was mostly demonstration, then we were quite happy with that. So what it was is, it, the interview's not critical. What they do is they put a bunch of, of books out to everybody that applies, and they have to demonstrate. Was this, this a public library? Yes, public library in Burnaby. I'm a grade 11 student at a high school, and I work at the local library. In terms of future goals, I plan to finish high school and continue with the post-secondary education as well. Before the customized employment program, I had difficulty thinking that he would do well in a job simply because he didn't know how to go about the process of getting a job, and um, I felt that the employers might not be able to deal with uh, issues that came up during his employment. Uh, I was really um, wanting to get started with this really early because I knew that there would be quite a process involved getting to employment. Um, my goals for him, you know, for, at a very early age is, you know, independence, uh, have your own life, um, be able to work for a living, and all that kind of thing that everybody else does was my major goal for him and it was extremely important for me to start really early and as a result I went to job placement places uh, uh, before he was even 14 and I remember going up to these people and they were all like wow you, you're starting awfully young and I go because I know I need to I mean it's very important that he does get a, a, a really good shot at getting employment and if it takes me you know four to five years to do it, may as well start early and get it started. So, actually, that's a bigger predictor in our high school transitions. Actually, predictor number two is having a paid job on my resume is one of the biggest predictors that I will continue to be employed and not actually end up in the handicapped continuum. Bigger predictor is, in fact, parents. Parent support and parents that promote employment in high school. So, that's your perfect example there. So this was really um, Kevin's mom really being there at the IP uh, meetings. At first we had some barriers at the, with the school team, not really seeing the, the importance, but that really opened up. Uh, let me just move us ahead here. Um, my experience with... Uh... Maybe not speaking at all. But after I got the job, I started speaking more and more and it still continues to this day. Well, uh, as a result of Kevin having this job, he has become very confident. Uh, he stands tall, he's uh, very assured of himself now, he feels like he's contributing, and uh, he's just a very, very happy guy. So, what uh, his school team really noticed, I think that really opened their eyes, was, it truly was transformative for Kevin, to see what the job did for self-confidence, his self-esteem, interacting with others. Um, they used the terms, it's amazing. It was pretty phenomenal, the difference. So 
what you'll also see here is how he becomes more self-determined, more self-confident, starts to set his goals, and you'll see where he's at now um, four years later. You have finished maybe my current ASIC course and a year or two of BCIT, then landing a potentially full-time job in the computer support field, as well as acquiring like, a driver's license to be nice to have a car, living independently, and yeah, being self-sufficient and stuff. So again, you start to see the self-confidence. Um, you see, there's my next goal. Here's my next part of my career path growing out of um, that, that page position. Also, the social aspects and you know, growth in multiple areas. So we're starting to see that, that, that pattern emerge more and more. Some of the barriers. So what, I mean, this is all just a very small pilot project, but fundamentally where most of our resources are going is in a very traditional in that day program. So uh, graduate from high school down a segregated pathway and segregation uh, really for life. So when we look at the conversion research and literature, um, one of the biggest barriers is the negative attitudes within the organizations and a belief that, that there is a zero reject principle and people can be employed. Whatever we're doing major conversion strategies, either the agencies themselves really need to unpack their funding because the funding is really about buildings. Um, so agencies have gone through conversion. What some of them have done, some of the agencies gone through the conversion process is they'll leverage their assets and actually sell them to become community-based or to use those assets in another way, leverage the assets that they have renting out to other community uh, organizations. Um, so you either have to fund internally right, to shift your dollars or you need to fund the innovation in a very serious way. You've got to fund what the new system looks like in a very se serious way to get leverage and then start shifting your funding from the traditional um, services. Um, lack of expertise. So for many individuals, this is a whole other world and a different skill set going out and actually doing job development, spending time with businesses, and more fundamentally, having the systematic instructional pieces to actually being able to, and being able to make the accommodations. So uh, historically, in our adult service agencies, there hasn't been a lot of training in those areas. Um, and our agencies will, are speaking more and more that um, it's been uh, difficult to, to actually attract and recruit um, uh, individuals with that skill set. It's a very different skill set of being out in the community, doing systematic instruction, fading support to the natural supports, than supporting someone in a group setting. Uh, so there is a... a, a, a fairly big upswing in terms of training that, that would need to happen to scale up. Conversion takes incredible leadership um, at the organizational level and uh, being able to actually um, shift from what has been a very embedded model for 30 years to be able to really take that and shift it in, in uh, uh, you know, it's not just a little shift, it's a massive shift in how the organization funds, operates, trains, and supports people. Um, and then the other one was uh, the transportation. So uh, historically, there's transportation tied to getting people to one spot, whereas in terms of employment, you're everywhere at different times. But there are creative solutions around that, even for individuals that uh, um, may not be able to uh, access public transit, what some of the agencies that have gone through conversion have done is they've just pooled their resources with others in the community. You go, how many others in the community do we need, uh, need to get around seniors? So 
just really making some creative options where some individuals have actually pooled their resources and got uh, and purchased transportation that gets seniors around and individuals in the um, in employment. If we'll have time, I'll open it up to questions. But I, I'll, well, actually, what I'll do is I'll give you one um, one example, and then we'll open it up to questions. So one of the things that we discovered during the last four years through the customized employment process is uh, when we follow the process well um, from all of those aspects, from discovery to really good job development, partnerships, understanding the, the companies, finding that mutually beneficial relationship, doing good job coaching, they were able to get a whole range of individuals employed that were deemed unemployable. But what we also recognized is there's, um, the research is really clear that we really need to start this process at high school. So what's happened now is the last two years of our, our customized employment project have been working with our high school partners on self-determination instruction and paid employment. So it's really focusing on self-directed life plans with an employment focus. And it began with the uh, Burnaby School District. And I'll just show you first what that looks like. So we're working with our partners in the Burnaby School District. We're Vancouver School District now. And we're talking to Coquitlam, where we really start developing self-directed IEPs with individuals. Um, but they're broader than that. They're really self-directed life plans. So what it really talks about is teaching individuals that goal setting process, but as well walking them through that whole process, which we were doing three years ago in the more traditional format, where we would do all the, that process, sort of, we would do discovery, we'd do the job development, we would get those placements, but what we discovered is the individuals, uh, many of them, if they wanted another job or need to look for another job, they would phone their job coach. Can you get me another job or I need another job? What we realize is we need to teach individuals that process. How do I do my own discovery? How do I go and do my own job development? How do I identify what supports that I might need? So uh, that began last year with the Burnaby School District. And we worked with the Burnaby School District, uh, provided uh, online training to their teaching assistants on customized employment and worked with the teachers to develop the self-directed IEPs. And I'll just give you an example here. Hi, my name is Eric. Welcome to my IEP meeting. Today, I'm going to teach you all about me and tell you what some of my goals are for this school year, things I like. One of the things I like to do is woodworking, especially making wooden trays. My goal, getting a job, building furniture. My ideas, to reach this goal in one year. I need to search on the internet to find the companies near my house that make furniture. I need to find a trade school to can teach more about work. So he's got paid employment now. That was in his last year of high school. In five months, I need to contact the Burnaby Higher Skills. I need to find a location on the internet and learn how to get there. My goal, learn how to hop out around the house my ideas to reach this goal in five months. I will help my dad, uh, mom and dad help clean the windows in our house once a month. I will help uh, my parents take out the garbage every week. I will help my parents uh, dust their furniture every week. My goal, learn how to take the bus by myself, my ideas to reach this goal by myself in 10 months. I need to plan some small trips on a bus maybe to one or two stations. I need to learn how to use my phone and get help if I need to. I need to learn how to ask the bus driver for help if I need it. He's independent on the bus now. I basement suite with a friend. My idea is to reach his goal in five years. I need to get a job so I have money to pay the rent. I need to learn how to go shopping, how to cut, how to clean, how to wash clothes, how to pay bills. I also need 
to your tiny roommate. Okay, so he's got all of his life goals. This is where I want to live. And the employment's the big anchor. That's what we know. If we teach employment, uh, bus taking, that opens up the doors, quality of life, huge connection to quality of life. So it's, if that's our goal, that every student that graduates, whether it's a student with autism, any other student, every, if a student graduates with um, paid employment, it can take the bus and I'm socially connected. That's the way that we break that barrier. They're not going in to the day programs and the segregated stream. So we've, we began that process and what we found is that the reason we called that the self-directed life plan, because what that does is pulls that transition protocol together. It says, these are my life goals. MCFD, do I have MCFD supports? They should be connected to one of those goals that could be employment. Bus, get me connected to the ceramics class at the, at the community center. So what it's done is really, what employment does is opens up everyone's eyes to the fact that this can happen. And if I can be supported with the natural supports in a workplace, it's just a logical extension. Of course I can be supported at the community center you know, on the ceramics class. And... So it just starts to open up that thinking that we work sequentially on building that inclusive life uh, you know, over with employment as the focus and then leverage the new funding to say the 15000 or whatever goes into a day program, that's to fund my next goal on my life plan. All right. So we're pretty excited about this and this is what, what um, our MSD funding is doing now funding us to work with our school partners and there's a lot of lift on this right now as everybody's going we need to change how we're doing things the research has been pretty clear for over 30 years really so we have enough demonstration of it's just shifting that whole um, system which really is our as big a social policy change as uh, deinstitutionalization was and we just need to understand that that's where we're at 